All right, we are back with day two. Um, so I was here for about four or five hours last night with Hiram, and then maybe you can tell him how much more time you were here today, just so you guys get an idea of how extensive this process is. Yeah, I put in a couple hours again today before we came, kind of prepping things, and it, it you know, it can go long. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of screws to turn, so. <laughs> well, great, what do you want to start with well, today? Well, if I can remember where we were, Yesterday, we looked at uh, setting the repetition springs and kind of how, well, how that affects things. So I want to look at, I'll just mention um, the next thing I would do. One of, one of the things that we talked about that we can adjust on the piano is where the hammer starts in relation to the strings when the key's at rest, right? Okay. That distance that the hammer has to travel and how that can affect your power as a pianist and also your speed, right? Obviously the less distance the hammer has to travel, the action's a little faster, but you also sacrifice some power because you don't have as much room to accelerate the hammer into the string. So it's a trade-off. And, but also, I mean, there's more to it than that. It, it has to do with the timing of, the hammer needs to hit the string in a timely way in relation to when the key's going down. Right. So it hits right at about the right place to the bottom of the stroke. If it hits too late in the stroke, it doesn't feel good. It feels like you're kind of playing on bricks. If it hits too early, it just feels kind of mushy and you kind of fall through things. So, um, so what I'm getting at with these jack adjustments is I'm trying to create a stable platform so that I can get a nice hammer line. Now I've worked on a lot of the piano already. So you can see this, you know, this hammer line is just, just, just perfectly smooth here. And it's not perfectly straight across if you look at the horizon because the height of the strings isn't perfectly straight. The piano's kind of bowed and you see that curvature of the soundboard as in the way that I've set this, it rises a little bit and falls towards the treble. Right. That's really crucial in, in getting a good sound. So, uh, but anyways, just so you're aware. Sure, and I see just, like I see like that one's poking up a little bit, just yeah. very slightly. Do you see those types of inconsistencies in pianos or is that something that you're gonna adjust today? You definitely see that. Um, and w these hammers that are sticking up, I've set some samples and I'll show you how I did that in a second. Um, just before I get to that, just so you know, there is one other adjustment that, um, that we look at on the piano. So, in fact, Josh, if you want to get in close, I'll show yeah. you this really quick. We talked about this repetition lever and then the jack. So we set the position when the jack falls back there and it's at rest. We set where it is front to back. But I can also set the height of this lever with this button back here. Now the height of that lever, I'm probably creating a lot of shadow here, but the height of that uh, lever matters because if it's high, I'm going to go ahead and... Which le Can you point out which level lever yeah, you're talking this, about? Yeah, this repetition lever, it's this beam that goes across here. Perfect, okay. Okay, that can rock back and forth, right? So if I lower this button here, that's going to lower, it's going to push the back of this up and it's going to push the front of it down and the jack is more exposed, see? Uh -huh. Really extreme here. Sure. But if I raise it, I can also raise the top of this. Now the jack is really buried in there. Sure. So this is on a spring, remember. You don't want it this way because if the, the hammer has to, it's kind of floating it when it starts on a grand piano. It's not resting against anything but the key, so it's just ready to go. Uh-huh. Just ready to fire for you. But if it's, well, here Josh, I'm gonna have you describe kind of what you're feeling on that note at the okay. attack. If you set that on Just you, on the low A? Yeah, just on that A. Okay. Just kind of feel it, just if you were to push slowly. Sure. All right, so normal note. I think it feels like it's less powerful, yeah. but like uh, maybe lighter almost, but, but like I don't actually have a tactile feel to the hammer as much as this. I feel like I'm really like, in contact with the hammer here, like my fingertip can feel that hammer raising. This one, it feels ambiguous. 
Yeah, there's nothing that happens in the first part of the stroke. And that's exactly what it is. You're not in contact with the hammer because that jack is so low. Okay. And it's floating. And also, you know, that's not a very stable platform for the hammer to be resting on on essentially a spring, right? So I can hit it hard and it settles in different places, low and high. Uh-huh. So to create a firm platform the, uh, with the ground, then we set the height of this to where the jack is really doing most of the work supporting the hammer, just ready to fire. And, but, I, but I can't set it too low or we get, what we get here is that the jack I'm going to trip this out with my finger, and we'll probably see this in the head cam too. It might be hard to see because you're coming in at that angle, but if you look through this window here, or on the other side, as okay. I trip the jack, it didn't go all the way back under the knuckle. Did you see that? It gets caught. Oh, uh-huh. So I can't, you know, I can't, I'm not going to repeat very well. It's going to trip out and it's not going to reset very well. Okay, and that's if? That's if this rep lever set too low. Okay. Or, you know. So I need to go a little bit higher and a little bit more. There. Now it's No, I know that it's supporting that. Both the rep lever and the jack are kind of helping one another, but it's a firm it's a firm foundation, if you will, you know, for that hammer to sit on. But it's also ready to go. There's no wasted motion and it can reset very quickly for repetition. Great. So okay. now that that's it, we can do the samples. Okay. And I'll just show you how, you know, that might be done typically. Let me grab a gauge here. So every manufacturer has a specification typically where the starting point should be. And I think Steinway though is always held to, if it doesn't work at that specification, adjust it so that it works. So, so this is just a gauge that, you know, it has that built-in spec for the, this size of Steinway for me. Just cut out of wood. Sometimes you'll see metal gauges. But so what I'll do is I'll stick the gauge and I'll, I'll, I'll get the dampers out of the way and I'll prop a hammer and squish that gauge between the hammer and the string. Then I can come down and you're not going to see this too well, but I can adjust the hammer height by turning this screw, these screws down here okay. to match that, that uh, hammer that's being held by the gauge. So I just put it right to the same height there, uniform. Yeah, and so I'll set all the what I do is I set B's and E's and then the ends of the section. So that's going to give me a good idea of. So you're setting hammer height right now, is that yeah, correct? Yeah. Okay. So I set, and I already set the B's and E's in this section. So I'm going to pull the action up. We'll be able to see it nice and clear. Sounds great. As I basically just fill in the dots, connect the dots and make a line. Okay. <laughs> The finish on this is on this piano is polyester. It's a lot harder than if I had like a lacquer piano. You know, I might want to be careful setting something on there that it would scratch. But polyester is oh, gotcha. hard enough. Just right so, on. Right. Just in case if anybody gasped, you know, from that. So, <laughs> um, and so basically, I'm just going to fill in the spaces. I've got my samples here, so I draw attention to my eye just by winking them there, and then I'm going to raise something in the middle because it's easier to put a midpoint on something than it is to kind of go down a line you get off after a while so so just to confirm for our audiences like this guy right here you've raised that yeah. one you've raised that one and, and then that one, one now you're raising the ones in between yeah Terrific. and you'll notice look this base section that is not a straight line with the horizon uh -huh. it slopes up as we get higher in the scale right right i don't know if you can see that but um that it's just matching the height of the strings. If I just say, well, I'm going to set them all just nice and beautiful right across, then you're not taking something into account that could change your touch. I see. So this is kind of bowed. And you know, when a piano is brand new, it's the, the hammer line can be a little bit squirrely at first. Uh -huh. There's a lot of com compacting of the synthetic buckskin that's in there and the felts that are in there 
over that first, you know, depending on how hard you play the piano, there is some compacting of those felts, so it does change, you know, how solid this is. How much does that get jostled around when it's being shipped? Is that significant or minimal? This hammer line setting? Yes. Um, I mean, the hammers might move, but they'll fall right back to where they should have. Okay, so these these screws are pretty tight. They're not going to become loose oh, as yeah, they're the being screws, shipped. No, no. If, that, that, if, if so, they would need to be repaired if they were that loose. Okay. Um, no, the bigger factor with shipping is humidity changes. That would actually change the way this action sits in the, in the key bed. Uh -huh. And so you're going to get you know, a different key, key dip, things like that. You might, some things might feel a little tighter. I see. Screws might become loose that hold these parts together, those kinds of things can happen with a climate shift. The piano does pretty well shipping. Yeah. And in storage. Good to know. Yeah. So let's see, just about got this section. And why exactly are you hitting those <laughs> notes as you do it? rather than just visually lining that up. Yeah, so there's the visual aspect that helps me see it, but also it settles it in to where it's actually gonna be when you play oh. the piano. Nice, okay. And if I go like this, that takes a long time. Yeah. <laughs> and it's actually not as accurate as if I just kind of tap them. I've, that's just a trick I've learned in setting it. Nice. So, yeah, I don't know, is that annoying to... <laughs> See the constant tapping there, but. I've watched Hiram do this on my piano. It's tedious. He's like, okay, go get, go get some dinner while I do, <laughs> do this section or the whole piano, I guess. But for me, this is one of the most comfortable things you do with regulations. It's up here where I can reach, you know, uh -huh. I'm not <laughs> peering into the darkness. It's great, so <laughs> I don't mind too much. Okay, so we've got that. And I did this, that similar setting to the rest of the piano there. So I'm just gonna taper it out so that it makes. Have you ever noticed that you or other technicians have gotten tendonitis from re repetitive motions doing this? Cause I mean, you're tuning, turning, tuning pins all day and screws. I've had issued from turning screwdrivers. Okay. I think, you know, an injury or lifting something heavy, lifting a plate, you know, when it's in the shop. Uh huh. Um, not so much just from these small screws, but I do try and be mindful of my body position so that I don't. Yeah, I can imagine yeah. crouching My all bad. day, yeah. looking into the action could be... Slouching all day, <laughs> yeah. odd angles. So that's, that's our hammer line. It looks pretty good. Great. And you did this before I got here today. Yes, right? I did all of that. So Perfect. And uh, so we're going to carry on from here. We're going to look at let off and drop in our next segment. Okay, sounds great.